This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan. The Romance of Tristan and Isolde by Joseph Bedier. Translated by H. Belloc. Part the First The Childhood of Tristan. My lords, if you would hear a high tale of love and of death, here is that of Tristan and Queen Isolde. How to their full joy, but to their sorrow also, they loved each other, and how at last they died of that love together upon one day, she by him, and he by her. Long ago, when Mark was king over Cornwall, Rivelin, king of Lyonnais, heard that Mark's enemies waged war on him, so he crossed the sea to bring him aid, and so faithfully did he serve him with counsel and sword, that Mark gave him his sister Blanche Fleur, whom King Rivelin loved most marvellously. He wedded her in Tintagel Minster, but hardly was she wed when the news came to him that his old enemy, Duke Morgan, had fallen on Lyonnais, and was wasting town and field. Then Rivelin manned his ships in haste, and took Blanche Fleur with him to his far land. But she was with child. He landed below his castle of Canoel, and gave the queen in ward to his marshal Roholt, and after that set off to wage his war. Blanche Fleur waited for him continually, but he did not come home, till she learnt upon a day that Duke Morgan had killed him in foul ambush. She did not weep. She made no cry or lamentation. But her limbs failed her, and grew weak, and her soul was filled with a strong desire to be rid of the flesh, and though Roholt tried to soothe her, she would not hear. Three days she awaited reunion with her lord, and on the fourth she brought forth a son, and taking him in her arms she said, Little son, I have longed a while to see you, and now I see you the fairest thing ever a woman bore. In sadness came I hither, in sadness did I bring forth, and in sadness has your first feast day gone. And as by sadness you came into the world, your name shall be called Tristan, that is the child of sadness. After she had said these words she kissed him, and immediately when she had kissed him she died. Broholt, the keeper of faith, took the child, but already Duke Morgan's men besieged the castle of Canoel all round about. There is a wise saying, Full hardy was never hardy, and he was compelled to yield to Duke Morgan at his mercy. But for fear that Morgan might slay Rivelin's heir, the marshal hid him among his own sons. When seven years were passed, and the time had come to take the child from the women, Roholt put Tristan under a good master, the squire Gorvenal, and Gorvenal taught him in a few years the arts that go with barony. He taught him the use of lance and sword and scutcheon and bow, and how to cast stone quoits, and to leap wide dykes also. And he taught him to hate every lie and felony, and to keep his given word. And he taught him the various kinds of song and harp playing, and the hunter's craft. And when the child rode among the young squires, you would have said that he and his horse and his armour were all one thing. To see him so noble and so proud, broad in the shoulders, loyal, strong and right, all men glorified Roholt in such a son. But Roholt, remembering Rivelin and Blanche Fleur, of whose youth and grace all this was a resurrection, loved him indeed as a son, but in his heart revered him as his lord. Now all his joy was snatched from him on a day when certain merchants of Norway, having lured Tristan to their ship, bore him off as a rich prize, though Tristan fought hard, as a young wolf struggles caught in a gin. But it is a truth well proved, and every sailor knows it, that the sea will hardly bear felon ship, and gives no aid to rapine. The sea rose and cast a dark storm round the ship and drove it eight days and eight nights at random, till the mariners caught through the mist a coast of awful cliffs and seaward rocks, 
whereon the sea would have ground their hull to pieces. Then they did penance, knowing that the anger of the sea came of the lad, whom they had stolen in an evil hour, and they vowed his deliverance, and got ready a boat to put him, if it might be, ashore. Then the wind and sea fell and the sky shone, and as the Norway ship grew small in the offing, a quiet tide cast Tristan and the boat upon a beach of sand. Painfully he climbed the cliff and saw beyond a lonely rolling heath and a forest stretching out and endless. And he wept, remembering Gorvenal, his father, and the land of Lyonnais. Then the distant cry of a hunt with horse and hound came suddenly and lifted his heart, and a tall stag broke cover at the forest edge. The pack and the hunt streamed after it with a tumult of cries and winding horns. But just as the hounds were racing clustered at the haunch, the quarry turned to bay at a stone's throw from Tristan. A huntsman gave him the thrust, while all around the hunt had gathered and was winding the kill. But Tristan, seeing by the gesture of the huntsman that he made to cut the neck of the stag, cried out, "'My lord, what would you do? Is it fitting to cut up so noble a beast like any farmyard hog? Is that the custom of this country?' And the huntsman answered, "'Fair friend, what startles you? Why, yes, first I take off the head of a stag, and then I cut it into four quarters, and we carry it on our saddle-bows to King Mark, our lord. So do we, and so since the days of the first huntsman have done the Cornish men. If, however, you know of some nobler custom, teach it us. Take this knife, and we will learn it willingly.' Then Tristan kneeled and skinned the stag before he cut it up, and quartered it all in order, leaving the crow-bone all whole, as is meat, and putting aside at the end the head, the haunch, the tongue, and the great heart's vein. And the huntsman and the kennel hinds stood over him with delight, and the master huntsman said, Friend, these are good ways. In what land learnt you them? Tell us your country and your name. "'Good Lord, my name is Tristan, "'and I learnt these ways in my country of Lyonnais. "'Tristan,' said the master huntsman, "'God reward the father that brought you up so nobly. "'Doubtless he is a baron, rich and strong.' "'Now Tristan knew both speech and silence, "'and he answered, "'No, Lord, my father is a burgess. "'I left his home unbeknownst upon a ship "'that trafficked to a far place.' "'for I wish to learn how men lived in foreign lands. "'But if you will accept me of the hunt, "'I will follow you gladly "'and teach you other crafts of venery. "'Fair Tristan, I marvel there should be a land "'where Burgess's son can know "'what a knight's son knows not elsewhere. "'But come with us since you will it, and welcome. "'We will bring you to King Mark, our lord.' "'Tristan completed his task. "'To the dogs he gave the heart, the head, offal and ears, and he taught the hunt how the skinning and the ordering should be done. Then he thrust the pieces upon pikes, and gave them to this huntsman and to that to carry, to one the snout, to another the haunch, to another the flank, to another the chine. And he taught them how to ride by twos in rank, according to the dignity of the pieces each might bear. So they took the road and spoke together, till they came on a great castle and round it fields and orchards, and living waters and fish-ponds and plough-lands, and many ships were in its haven, for that castle stood above the sea. It was well fenced against all assault or engines of war, and its keep, which the giants had built long ago, was compact of great stones, like a chessboard of vert and azure. And when Tristan asked its name, "'Good liege,' they said, "'we call it Tintagel.' And Tristan cried, Tintacle, blessed be thou of God, and blessed be they that dwell within thee. Therein, my lords, therein had Rivelin taken Blanche Fleur to wife, though their son knew it not. When they came before the keep, the horns brought the barons to the gates, and King Mark himself. And when the master huntsman had told him all the story, and King Mark had marvelled at the good order of the cavalcade, and the cutting of the stag, 
and the high art of venery in all. Yet most he wondered at the stranger boy, and still gazed at him, troubled and wondering whence came his tenderness, and his heart would answer him nothing. But, my lords, it was blood that spoke, and the love he had long since borne his sister Blanche Fleur. That evening, when the boards were cleared, a singer out of Wales, a master, came forward among the barons in hall and sang a harper's song. And as this harper touched the strings of his harp, Tristan, who sat at the king's feet, spoke thus to him, O oh, master, that is the first of songs. The Bretons of old wove at once to chant the loves of Greyland. And the melody is rare, and rare are the words. Master, your voice is subtle. Harp us that well. But when the Welshman had sung, he answered, Boy, what do you know of the craft of music? If the burgesses of Lyonnais teach their sons harp, play also, and rotes and viols too. Rise and take this harp and show your skill. Then Tristan took the harp and sang so well that the barons softened as they heard, and King Mark marvelled at the harper from Lyonnais whither so long ago Rivlin had taken Blanche Fleur away. When the song ended, the king was silent a long space, but he said at last, Son, blessed be the master that taught thee, and blessed be thou of God, for God loves good singers. Their voices and the voice of the harp enter the souls of men and wake dear memories and cause them to forget many a morning and many a sin. For our joy did you come to this roof. Stay near us a long time, friend. And Tristan answered, Very willingly will I serve you, sire, as your harper, your huntsman, and your liege. So did he, and for three years a mutual love grew up in their hearts. By day, Tristan followed King Mark at pleas and in saddle. By night, he slept in the royal room with the counsellors and the peers. And if the king was sad, he would harp to him to soothe his care. The barons also cherished him, and, as you shall learn, Dinas of Lydon, the seneschal, beyond all others. And more tenderly than the barons and than Dinas, the king loved him. But Tristan could not forget, or Rohalt his father, or his master Gorvenal, or the land of Lyonnais. My lords, a teller that would please should not stretch his tail too long, and truly this tail is so various and so high that it needs no straining. Then let me shortly tell how Rohalt himself, after long wandering by sea and land, came into Cornwall, and found Tristan, and showing the king the carbuncle that once was Blanche Fleur's, said, King Mark, here is your nephew Tristan, son of your sister Blanche Fleur, and of King Rivelin. Duke Morgan holds his land most wrongfully. It is time such land came back to its lord. And Tristan, in a word, when his uncle had armed him knight, crossed the sea, and was hailed of his father's vassals, and killed Rivelin's slayer, and was re-seized of his land. Then remembering how King Mark could no longer live in joy without him, he summoned his council and his barons and said this, Lords of Lyonnais, I have retaken this place, and I have avenged King Rivelin by the help of God and of you. But two men, Rohalt and King Mark of Cornwall, nourished me, an orphan and a wandering boy. So should I call them also fathers. Now a free man has two things thoroughly his own, his body and his land. To Rohalt then here I will release my land, do you hold it, father, and your son shall hold it after you. But my body I give up to King Mark. I will leave this country, dear though it be, and in Cornwall I will serve King Mark as my lord. Such is my judgment. But you, my lords of Lyonnais, are my lieges, and owe me counsel. If, then, some one of you will counsel me another thing, let him rise and speak." But all the barons praised him, though they wept, and taking with him Gorvenal only, Tristan set sail for King Mark's land. End of the Childhood of Tristan <laughs>